turn it over to my fantastic partner. I have to say, when Christine asked me to do this, and she goes, what do you think we asked for Janine to? I'm like, yay! <laughs> I love Janine. Uh -oh. Janine and I have worked together for, on and off for the past two years at EDD. And let me tell you, she is amazing as a partner. So I just wanted to let her bring you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. There you go, Janine. All right. I just need that. Yep, from you. Thank you. you. All right, so uh, I was sitting back there. I, Nicole and I work really well together, but I'm sitting back there excited, just wanting to jump out. Uh, I have a few of my former team members in the room who know how I get as far as wanting to jump in, because we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, we're going to talk about those uh, organization, the cultural organization. I have, I'm born and bred in state government uh, 20 years now. Uh, I think according to CalPERS at 17, but I worked really hard those first three years as a student <laughs> assistant, right? Those student assistants out there, so I count that time. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so risk. And we're talking intelligent risk taking. We're not encouraging you to jump out there willy nilly and just start trying stuff. You want to put some thought into it. So let me ask you when you see that term, intelligent risk, or as we w went ahead and ERT, what does intelligent risk taking mean to you? What's your definition? This is interactive because this is like an hour and 50 minute or actually 45 minutes because we've been asked to cut, cut it short by five minutes. What does that mean to you, intelligent risk taking? It's calculated. It's calculated. Mm -hmm. Strategic. Strategic, absolutely. Feasible. I'm sorry? Feasible, Feasible. okay. Data driven, yes, I love, love, love. We use Lean Six Sigma at EDD. Uh, Six Sigma, very much data driven. That's part of our methodology. And it enables us to help to actually take more risk because we have what we uh, term as our sword and shield that we bring with us and we make our case and we help our leaders make data driven decisions and make that case so that they can say, all right, we haven't tried this before, but you know what, it looks like we have enough data to support it. So absolutely, you wanna have a process by which you make those decisions. And we're gonna talk about making high quality, timely decisions as a leader, because that's definitely uh, all of us in the room. That's part of our responsibility as well, as being able to make those uh, timely, high quality decisions. Okay, so there's a few barriers to intelligent risk taking though. The first one that I see, I've managed, I've led, I've participated in uh, many projects at EDD and my former uh, agency, Department of Re Rehabilitation. Fear. Be honest, Does, do you get kind of fearful about taking risk? It's scary, right? Forget everything and run, just forget about it, right? Yeah, it's, it's scary. Uh, another barrier is perfectionism. This is something I remember coming up in this, uh, as a student assistant and an uh, office technician, and it was driven. Do not even think about submitting that if it's not perfect. Well, in my personal life, I had grandparents that used to remind me no one is perfect, right? Unless you can walk on water, you're not perfect. So that challenge that we have with wanting everything to be perfect before we can submit it, before we can suggest it, it definitely becomes a, a, a barrier to taking some risk because then we move into procrastination, what I like to call analysis paralysis. We do, we're fearful, we're scared, we're not really sure. Maybe we tried something 10, 15, 20 years ago, got our hands slapped. Um, as someone said to me the other day, yeah, I got warehoused after a while. They put me in another office. I think I was just a little too much of a rebel. Uh, and so then that's the part of the, that becomes the, the organizational culture. Don't take risks because then you'll take away the good assignments, right? That can definitely be a challenge. And it's something that we as organizations, we have to actually ha start having some very transparent and candid conversations about that. And so when I'm working with leaders in our organizations, because we do a lot of process improvement projects at EDD, innovation and risk taking, they go hand in hand. We cannot innovate without taking some sort of risk, but it's intelligent risk taking. And I think what I love about EDD, I've been there, let's see, 16 years now, uh, grown up in this particular department, is I'm seeing more and more of it. We're taking baby steps in certain areas. We're making strides in many areas. Um, so I'm really excited to see my agency move forward. And I'm actually gonna share with you a few things through my research that I found. And I have a few uh, of our leaders within the department that have offered to be guinea pigs and try out some of these innovative ideas that I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, and then we get into this, um, the irrationality, and there's many forms. There's an irrational need for control, 
right? We may work alongside folks that have that irrational need for control, uh, irrational need for certainty, approval, and sometimes it's just that playing it safe. So when Nicole was talking earlier about it starts in here, it starts with you, that's one of the first things that you can do. You have, we have action plans that we're gonna talk about later. Last week, I just Googled risk assessment, so, you know, assessment, and uh, found a really, it was like easy 30 minute risk assessment test. You just plug in your answers, it gives you a score. So then I send it out to some of my project managers. And I, I ended up out of one, it was one out of 100, I scored like a 63. So I'm a pretty good risk taker at work. I'll tell you, a lot of that comes from the fact that I have worked for leaders that allowed me to take risk. When I failed, and I have many a time at EDD, there's a lot of folks here at EDD who can attest to that, um, they picked me up, we had, it was a lesson learned. How can we make this better for next time? They didn't strip my assignments of me, you know, from me and say, oops, you messed up, you don't get to try that again. So that's why I'm actually able to take more risk. Well, I've been pushing one of my project managers a little too hard in area, and I realized it after I had her take the assessment. And when her score came back, and she's much more risk averse, I realized I'm pushing too fast, too soon. I'm trying to teach the way I would wanna be taught. And I'm like a boot camp style when they're yelling in your face, like that's what gets me motivated. The warm fuzzy stuff, not, you know, not so much. But that doesn't work for everyone. So really doing the assessment of what your style is, what your risk appetite is, is very important. So if you're a little bit more risk averse, usually what I recommend to people is, like Nicole said, get a coach, get a mentor. And I actually suggest getting a variety of coaches and mentors, like add to your network. Find people that are maybe like a couple steps above risk, you know, your, your level of risk aversion, right? So that way you can still kind of stay in your comfort zone. And then find somebody that is just innovating, they're bringing that kind of where you wanna be so that you get both perspectives along the way because you really wanna step out of your comfort zone in stages. Uh, if, if you are more risk averse, okay? So those are just some things to consider. Um, this is something that I know my coaches and mentors have shared with me. When I wanted to learn how to take more risk, I identified risk takers in the department at EDD. And I just basically said, and with mentoring and coaching, you initiate it. You basically ask them, hey, I, these are some characteristics I see in you, I value in you, I would love to emulate and learn more about your particular style. Would you be willing to mentor me? Would you be willing to coach me? A lot of people will say yes and will be very grateful for the opportunity. Okay, so we have a few other uh, barriers to intelligent risk taking that we tend to see. And these are things that, this has come out of my research, but I loved it because I struggled to articulate it before I found this. This is through the Harvard Business Review. Uh, and th but this is what I've seen in, in my years uh, at EDD. We overestimate the probability of something going wrong. So I've sat with my teams, we're gathering our data, we're doing our analysis, we're doing our research, we're moving into solution generation mode. Because remember, we're, we have some very, we have two very large uh, process improvement teams at EDD, but I also oversee smaller work groups. Uh, they're str uh, small but mighty, absolutely. Sometimes when we're sitting in there and having these discussions, we've got a lot of wisdom and experience in the room. And we start to move away from our data and we start to do the war stories, right? Sometimes you have those discussions about the war stories. And then we overestimate like, oh, this could potentially go wrong. You know why? Because 20 years ago when we tried this, this is what happened. And then though, there's some of us in the room that are like, all right, well, I guess we can't really go that route because uh, it didn't work 20 years ago. That's when I ask my uh, change agents in the room to defend, like speak up, defend this opportunity. And that's the other thing that you really wanna do too, is defend that opportunity to be able to say, look, we've gathered the data. We've, net, we've talked to other agencies. We feel very strongly based on our analysis, based on running everything through this process, that yes, there is a 20% chance that this could go wrong. But you know what, another component of that, um, sometimes we exaggerate the consequences of what might happen if it goes wrong. So with that, we need to have very, almost simple and basic conversations about, well, what could actually go wrong? Let, let, this is not where we bring in the, the fairy tales and the folklore and the, that, all that extra drama and theater, and I'm just saying that because that's kind of what I've seen at times, but 
it's also because it really depends on when you're in the group and having this discussion, it really depends on what that person's risk appetite is. So a lot of times something to, when someone says something to me, because I'm more of that on that scale of um, 60 to 70, I'm a risk taker, I hear, oh, that's really not that bad. I don't really think that's a big deal, right? Where there's like, uh, we could lose all of our federal funding, <laughs> right? Yes, that, I've had people tell me that. Like, you cannot do that, Janine. Department of Labor will strip us of our funding. So I ask, could we call Department of Labor and ask, when in life have you ever stripped an organization of their federal funding because they made this data-driven decision with all of this analysis and research? So, the, okay, maybe that's a little bit of an over-exaggeration, but <laughs> I have actually asked that question. Can I call DOL and ask if this has ever happened before? And I got a yes. Uh, someone in the room was the one that said, yes, you can call, Janine. Um, we sometimes we underestimate our ability to handle the consequences of risk. So when you're doing intelligent risk taking, you're doing both, right? You're looking at the potential positive outcomes. You're looking at what could potentially happen if it doesn't go right. And you're putting together your plan. So it's not, hey, make this decision. We think it's like 80% good. We still need to plan for that 20%. We, we gotta have a contingency plan. And I think we do not give ourselves enough credit for being able to, to have those contingent, contingency plans. So we wanna stay away from underestimating our ability. Through, uh, at EDD, some of the ways that we do that, we do a lot of networking, meeting, we talk with uh, leaders at various levels in the organization, or led leaders that have been with our organization for 30 plus years, right? But we also bring in our, the folks that are newer to our organization, who come from private sector, who come from um, nonprofit, right? Because they, they bring perspective and we can lay all of that on, out on the table and then we start to come up with our plan. And then one of the other strategies that we've uh, employed on our process improvement teams is we basically play our team members to their strengths. So as a leader, you really have to, uh, again, do your assessment first of your particular leadership style, but you gotta start doing some team player assessments as well. Know who your team players are, know what their strengths and weaknesses are, and play your team members to their strengths. So whenever we are going in to do a big ask, we put our knowledgeable, energetic, somewhat fearless folks in charge of that ask. Now we are actually bringing the others along too because we're coaching them because we need to build bench depth. I use a lot of sports analogies and I've never played a sport in my life, I just, it's, it's odd. Um, but we definitely want to build our bench depth, right? Knowledge transfer, capacity building. So another strategy that we've used at EDD, I know I've used personally, it was used on me and I found it very helpful, is I will let people stay in their comfort zone for so long. And then we put together an action plan, we identify very specific objective, objectives of how we're gonna move them into that next phase. And, we, and then I say three, in three months you will be presenting to the executives. I'll model the way first, but in three months it, I'm handing it off to you. And then I will be in the room and I'm there, I've got your back. I'm there to help you if you stumble and, or whatever you need. So you tell me what you need. So we roll that in as well, as far as building that bench step and that, that capacity. But you want to play your team members to their strengths first, because if someone is really risk averse, they need to build their confidence in being able to move out of that comfort zone. So start small. Um, Nicole mentioned this, you know, generating small wins. You got to generate small wins with yourself too. It also helps build your credibility. So if you start taking small, intelligent risks throughout your organization first, uh, and then start building that up, it becomes part of your inventory that you can share out and show, well, you know, we took this risk last year. We did this six months ago. This is how it turned out. You know, we did actually take a few steps back here, but this is how we corrected and we recalibrated. Communicate that out because sometimes our leaders don't see it, right? Sometimes we make things look so good because we've done all this work behind the scenes and our leaders have the benefit of just seeing it in all its glory. There's a lot of work and hustle that went on behind that, right? So you wanna share that out and you wanna communicate it out and share your methodology. Share the, everything, the good, the bad, whatever hash marks you guys were making um, to get to that decision. The other thing that we do is we discount or deny uh, the cost of inaction. 
So we downplay that. If we don't move, what will happen? Oh, let's not talk about that, right? Uh, or sticking to status quo. So this is where that leadership practice of challenging the process comes into play. You're challenging status quo. Again, play your team members to their strengths. Find the people first that love to challenge the status quo, right? And then build the capacity with uh, your remaining team members. Any questions so far? Yes. Okay, our change management team is really project-based right now. I do have a, uh, so the question was how big is the change management team at EDD? Uh, we have several, a couple large projects at EDD in our unemployment insurance and our disability insurance branch. We have business process innovation teams there. Our tax branch had a team prior to that. So with each project effort, we do have a change management component. We primarily use John Cotter's uh, eight, uh, steps right now. I think tax, our tax branch used uh, ProSize ADCAR. Mm -hmm. uh, so we use it, it's project based, if, if that helps. Because we really take a look at what the uh, particular project is. Not all of our projects are IT based. Within our um, two process innovation teams, we're looking at improving uh, turnaround time, so our service delivery time to our customers. We're looking at um, how can we improve the quality of the product that we produce, which for us in unemployment insurance, it's that UI benefit payment or that disability insurance payment. So we build our organizational change management component in the, we have two, we have the internal portion, so that's how do we bring our employees along to embrace the change, but then we also have the external um, change management if, if it's impacting our external customers. Does that help? There are times I will tell you we have some, uh, you know, we're like many other organizations. We have, re we have resource challenges. Uh, but I try, I know our leaders try not to let that stand in, in our way because you can do some great things with a few really skilled, uh, energetic, knowledgeable people okay. to get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. Yes? I would say, okay, so as far as change management skill set, are they, is that their only thing that they focus on? In my experience, and I cannot speak for our tax branch, I think they did have a very specific uh, change management uh, team, if that was their primary focus. With our two teams now, we really don't have them focus solely on change management. I actually am looking into, I'm researching the advantages uh, that uh, departments have as far as um, those who have a dedicated change management team. So that could change. I may make that recommendation to our Jenny, executives. Yes. I have something to add. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, DHCS. Okay, mm. so I'm working, I've been working there for four years. And we have a dedicated OCM team. Mm. Uh, we are mostly consultants because it is project-based. Mm. Uh, so depending upon the size, of a project. This is a multi-million dollar project. Uh, so therefore we have dedicated, and we have I think about five, and we all work in different areas supporting the organization, but it goes from um, business process improvement to uh, leadership development. So there's you know, a couple of us just really focus on developing the capacity within. Then there's just a guy dedicated to communications because communications is so critical, right? And actually we're adding a second person on this, hopefully. Um, <laughs> hopefully, uh, because there's so much communication that needs to be done both internally as well as externally, right, to all of the different stakeholders. Uh, and then we have a couple of people who are just project managers that are over significant portions of the project that are helping manage that change. And then we have, <laughs> a one person that's kind of that overarching, watching all the changes and mm -hmm. steering and making sure that we're all aligned to achieving the strategic goals of the organization. So I would say that it really depends upon what your organization needs are, what you would want to create as far as supporting that change. Because the more you have people watching and aligning the actions to the strategic goals, the more successful you're, you're gonna be at the end of the day. So yeah, thank you. Out. No, absolutely, that helps. I'm gonna check my time really quickly. Okay. So let's talk about your role as a leader when it comes to 
um, enabling the intelligent risk taking. We have some responsibility. We have a, there's some work that we've got to do as leaders. And so I think someone mentioned earlier about that safe environment. Cultivating that safe environment absolutely is very, very critical. So we'll get into that. Acknowledge, recognize, and celebrate. This is one that I, again, I, when I uh, interview and I talk with other project managers, leaders within our organization, we, we kind of go back and forth with how much we acknowledge and recognize and celebrate. But with intelligent risk taking, you actually want to verbally acknowledge, like this was a huge risk that we took with our organization. Let's celebrate that, right? That's how you start to change the culture, the organizational culture as far as that fear of the, you know, talking about it, that risk aversion, is you want to actually talk about it. Uh, say yes. So we're going to talk about the uh, saying yes, because typically, I think uh, there's some parents, if you're a parent in the room, sometimes you can, your default answer is no, right? <laughs> I actually, when my son was, uh, I think, four or five, he asked me, Mom, is your no your favorite word? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, are you sure? Because you say it a lot. And he was right. I did. And we say no a lot uh, in, in our uh, in work as well. And then as a leader, you want to make timely, high quality decisions. So we'll, we're going to talk about that. All right, cultivating a safe environment. This starts with creating a climate built on a foundation of trust, right? There's some trust that, or sometimes there's lack thereof, right, with trust. Um, but mutual respect. So this is two-way street here. We're talking trust goes both ways. And as leaders, sometimes we elevate into a position where it's almost expected that the trust and the respect should come with the title, I think. And so, you know, there are some leaders, I have a few that have shared that with me, and they were very candid about it. And they had to learn the hard way. Ooh, it does, mm -mm, doesn't work that way, All right? So this is a two-way, and then confidence. You have to have confidence as a leader in your ability to create a safe environment. And again, this all comes back to that personal assessment. You gotta do that personal assessment. Am I genuine? Do people believe when I say something? Do they believe it? Do they feel it within their heart, all right? And if you do, um, we heard someone mention feedback. When you, I would recommend doing, a, a, at like at Sac State, we do part of the, the leadership practice inventory is a 360. But you have to be mentally and emotionally prepared for that. Don't go into it if you're not really going to listen to the feedback. And don't attack the folks that are giving the feedback, right? <laughs> um, really open and, and just be well, ready to embrace it. And I think that's kind of what I see is I think I, I see people, they say it, but then it's like, oh, that hurt too bad. Mm -mm, nope. And I'm not working with that person anymore. Right? So you want to be open to receiving that feedback and then putting a plan into action as far as how you can either change or adapt or uh, correct that particular behavior. You want to maintain open lines of communication with the feedback loop. Again, that communication goes back and forth, and it should be continuous. These are ongoing conversations. And this is sometimes asking. Uh, I am currently conducting training up and down the state within EDD, and it's business process innovation training for managers and supervisors. And some have shared that it's not always the safest environment to share ideas. So I sent an email out to my LGM, our leadership for the government manager, because uh, I'm an alum of that group, and I, sent, and I said, hey, in your organizations, like, what, how do you guys feel about safety as far as being able to share? And they, you know, a few of them called me, a few of them emailed me. They're like, uh-uh, nope, not, not safe to, to share. And so I've been asking, like, where does that come from? Or is it a perception? It is, is it your perception? It could be both. It could be a combination of there was something or some organizational uh, culture that was set up and then it, it gives the perception that it's, it's not safe. So it's having that conversation of what does that really mean when you say that it's not safe to share. But we definitely want to cultivate a safe environment. And as a leader, the way we do that is engaging and involving our team in those conversations, but really taking it on a case by case, team player by team player uh, basis as well. Encourage and demonstrate transparency. This can be a challenge at times. I was very appreciative of the managers that I grew up with at EDD, that they would come back from these uh, executive leadership meetings and they would share information out. And sometimes they would even say, I have no idea what the thought process was behind this particular um, decision. 
this is the direction that we're moving, it, it will be challenging. And so even if we didn't agree as analysts, we appreciated that there was some amount of information that they shared with us. So being able to encourage and demonstrate, being able to say as a leader, I don't know, but you know what, let's find that answer together. Let's see who we can pick up the phone and call to see you know, what further information uh, we can uh, gather. And then one of the things that I find helpful in project management is uh, really understanding what's called the DREC, which is denial, resistance, ex exploration, and commitment. It's the cycle of change. So people, uh, how many of you are familiar with this, uh, the DREC cycle of change? Oh good, so we have a, a handful of people in the room. So people go through this cycle and they kind of go back and forth. So just uh, if you study this, I would definitely recommend it. But um, as a leader, you can actually help coach your folks as they go through these uh, stages. What I do, what I would do as a project manager when I did my stakeholder analysis and my influence map, I do interviews to find out where my leaders are on this particular, and some of it is I interview them directly, and then I just, it's, it's a little bit of everything. It's what they say, it's their body language, it's the eye contact, the lack thereof. I pay attention to things that are said in other meetings. I uh, meet with people that they meet with to just talk about where they may be on this cycle of change. And so then what I work on is, okay, if someone's in denial, so with our process improvement efforts, when someone is in denial about a process improvement effort, it's not so much they're like, oh my God, nope, we're not, we don't need to do that at EDD. It's more so that, well, in my world, things t t seem to be going great, so why would you try improving them? So that's their reality. That's considered denial, although denial has a negative connotation to it, but it's more so, let's move them into resistance where they're starting to open up and think, all right, well, you know, maybe it is worth putting a team together to take a look at this, because maybe my world and my reality is pretty good, but maybe there are some other units where it's like they are doing some wasteful, redundant processes over and over again that are extremely antiquated. And so a leader can really benefit from understanding the cycle of change and then recognizing where their folks are within the cycle, because you'll change your script. You will change your talking points based on where someone is in this cycle. Uh, and that is very, very important. I study, okay, so there's, these are some of my personal tactics. I study calendars, mm -hmm. and I study meetings that people have on their calendar. Why? Because I really don't wanna bring an idea, super crazy, out of the box, creative, right? When my bosses have had a day full of meetings where they're just like, People are telling them no all day long, or you know, because maybe then their first you know, answer will be no. So I study a lot of what's going on within our department, what's going on with the branches, uh, just to see, you know, I tap in with fiscal, like well, what's going on? Are people getting money or do we still kind of you know, not doing too well there? Um, and so that will help me gauge how, what's my script this time, mm -hmm. right? So that's how I go in proactively, and that's how you can go in proactively as a leader as well. Acknowledge, recognize, and celebrate. Acknowledge creativity, effort, and dedication of the team. Even if, and I'll tell you, I worked on a marketing campaign. I was in public affairs at EDD for uh, 10 years. I worked on a marketing campaign where our manager said, think outside the box, right? <coughs> give, give a ton of ideas on how we're gonna run this campaign. By the time it came back from the director's office, all I think I submitted 10 ideas, nine of them were red penned, right? Nope, can't do this, can't do this, can't do this. But what I really appreciated was, because I said think outside the box, so I did, uh, my manager really celebrated the creativity. I'm sorry that we can only do the poster in the hallways, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I, I love your passion and your enthusiasm, Janine, like keep sending the ideas forward, right? And that's, a, that's an actual, that was the actual campaign. I can only put posters in the hallway. So I appreciated that, like, all right, I'll keep bringing it to you, because one day, one of these is gonna stick, right? Because that leadership changes, right? Um, our, uh, the, the cultural organization changes. Celebrate intelligent risk in order to counteract the cultural resistance of failure. So if we're celebrating risk more and bringing that out to the table, then we start to, because uh, a lot of times it's we're so resistant to failure, that's what we celebrate, in a way. It's, it's wild, but we do. So you wanna celebrate the risk and acknowledge that. Positively coach and mentor through the failures. <clears throat> as a leader, absolutely. Uh, I'm sure you've been in a situation as you were coming up where you were wounded, right? You suggested something, you were 
as someone just shared with me, humiliated in a public meeting, right? Mm -hmm. But it's how we respond as leaders, how we coach and mentor and support and guide our folks through that time that really mean a lot as far as being able to celebrate. Recognize the opportunity to mitigate future risk through lesson learned discussions. Have those discussions and let's talk about where it didn't go so well. It's really important to have those. Say yes. So we really want to uh, resist the urge to say no. It's a default answer for a lot of our organizations. And what I've learned through interviewing a lot of managers and supervisors, and, and I'm just like, please, you know, just share with me candidly why no. Some have told me, well, it's no because I don't actually really understand what they're asking me for. <laughs> Right? Okay, well then maybe the answer could be yes, I need to see a little bit more data. Or it's no because I'm concerned about the resources that it's going to take. Okay, so yes, I need to see more as far as what you think it's going to take to get this done. So we want to make our default answer yes so that we can foster a culture that embraces the institutional yes. If we can create friction, and so this is something that I want to try, I'm just putting this out there, I want to try this at EDD, and I have a few <laughs> folks that have actually volunteered to try this in their um, particular organization within EDD. So we want to create friction for saying no to enable more ideas. So this is the example that I'm going to share with you that we're going to try out, and I have a few of my LGM uh, cohort managers that are going to try this. They said they would try this at their organization too. If a subordinate comes to a manager with a great idea and the data and analysis, all the research to back it up, you want to make the default answer yes. If a manager wants to say no, he or she should be required to write a two-page memo on why we shouldn't do it. As an analyst, I spent years writing memos trying to convince leadership to say yes. Right, it's a lot, it's a lot. So then, and my, actually my chief deputy pointed out the other day, yeah, sometimes, and if they start to sit down and write that summary paper for the no, it really makes you think about what are the reasons behind my no? Yep. And then it doesn't sound as uh, you know, uh, attractive anymore. So this is a, and I felt it was very innovative uh, that when I saw this, and I love it, I, it, and trust me, it's gonna cause some friction, I already know. <laughs> It's okay, I, that's kind of my, that, I mean, that's what I do. All right, so leaders role enabling. To make timely, high quality decisions, you wanna develop these traits. Perceptual acuity, perceptual acuity ability to see change becoming, coming before others do. And that comes from practice, that comes from experience, that comes from networking, that comes from research, analysis. So if you step up your game with perceptual acuity, this can absolutely help you in your role as a leader. Qualitative judgment, this allows people to formulate and select the right options. So we're talking about data-driven decisions here. So drive towards the data to help support your decision making. Credibility, you gotta have credibility. If you don't, I mean, no one's, they're not gonna pay attention, they're not gonna listen. So within your organization, you wanna really do an assessment of how, I think fundamentally, we build credibility by you know, being a person of our word, showing our results, showing performance, right? People learn to trust us. You gotta put in the work though. It's a, it's a hustle and it's a daily hustle for a lot of us um, to build that credibility. But the more you do, the easier it is a lot of times to walk through the door and have folks at least take the meeting with you and listen. And that's a big first step for some. So absolutely the credibility factor is big. All right, so I'm um, out of time, but I'm just gonna share a few. I've been interviewing managers throughout the state and asking them, like, how are you enabling risk? You know, what are some things, what, what is risk in your particular <laughs> office? And so I've had managers share with me, this is at EDD and other state organizations that I network with. Some of it is uh, just sending an email to another manager, asking for clarification on something. That was a huge risk for the manager that I interviewed because that, that particular manager views any time someone asks them a question as challenging their authority. So I said, well, were you challenging his authority? And he said, no, I was trying to gain clarity so that when I have to share this information with my staff, I know what I'm talking about. So I just basically said, you know, if you're coming from a genuine place of not, that's, I would communicate that. If that person still after that continues to think that you're challenging authority, I think that's one of those, it's you, not them, or it's them, not you, right? So um, the other areas that managers have shared with me are changing processes. We're doing a lot of process change at EDD, and we're changing some processes that have been rooted for a long time, and it can be very, very challenging. 
sometimes we slow down production to provide better quality to our customers. Huge risk. Huge. But we have the data to support why. And it's the uh, return on investment that we show later on. So we have a lot of folks that are um, as far as innovation at work. And I think some of the other ones that people have shared with me is uh, enabling and empowering their staff has been a big risk in certain areas. Automation, typically, a big risk that we take when we automate something. I have uh, colleagues of mine that <laughs> when we went through a few uh, automation changes at EDD, they were like, oh, it's time for me to retire, you know? But you know, they, they, and, and, and it's, it's not that, oh, I don't want, well, part of it is maybe that I don't want to learn something new, but they, we're in a different time. We're moving into a different uh, atmosphere. We're very, you know, so, as far as wanting to self-serve when it comes to technology, wanting, you can pretty much do anything on your phone nowadays, right? So we're moving into a, a different area. So we have a lot of organizations that I think are moving in a very innovative um, direction. But what I would say as I close out is, again, really do an assessment within your organization. Study your leader, study yourself. It starts with you, and then go out to your team, right? The, the people within your sphere of influence. Identify what their risk appetite is and then start to really do some research on your organization. Okay. All right, I think I'm running out of time for questions, so we'll, we'll capture questions um, maybe in Nicole's segment. Okay. I'll take, I'll take a couple, because I, yeah. I, I, I know okay, that good. there's probably Here. a few. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yes. Yes, right there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, some of it is I just ask them. So when, as, a, as a project manager, I have to usually meet with my executive sponsors. So I'll ask, like, what's your prime creative, you know, the type of the day? Are you middle? Are you a morning person? Are you late evening? Um, you start to learn trigger. So I ask them, what are your trigger words? What things set you off? Like, I shouldn't even say these things. I'm probably a little bit more forward in my approach as far as how I, but I felt that it just, I'm, I'm learning. I'm trying to learn that particular organization style. So times of day, um, certain meetings, absolutely. Because it changes that person's frame of mind and what they're willing uh, or able to really hear in that moment. So I will hold off on um, pushing certain things forward just based on what's going on with um, the leaders that I work with. Yeah. Absolutely. I have a deputy director I work with regularly, and Monday's at noon, and I bring lunch, there. and that's the time we talk, right, because he's fresh. He's gotten the, the emergencies of the weekend <laughs> over with, right, yes. because you don't want to hit him first thing on a Monday morning, because that is not a good time, trust me, okay? But yes, you've got to, and to me, it's about doing that assessment up front. And with the person who was afraid to uh, talk to a manager and email and asking a question, right, then don't email. Mm -hmm. Go have a conversation with them. People <coughs> react so much differently when you make connection with them. We are meant to connect with each other. So I get tired of the email because I think we hide behind it mm -hmm. way too often and we use that as an excuse for not doing what we know we should do. So get up and talk to them. That would be I agree. my advice. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other quick questions on that? And then we're going to move on. OK, anything in the back? OK. I know you raised your hand. I'll go ahead and take your yeah, hand. Yeah, one, one quick question. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you talk about the, the uh, importance of persuasion skills? Because when you build your network, you share your innovative approach, and then you have to kind of push it up to the executive team, mm -hmm. the ability to have other advocates in the room that can help support Excellent. Can I throw something in really quick? Go for it. I'm excited about this one. No, so yeah. with no. my project teams, we work on the two things that I coach right away, managing up. Mm -hmm. the, it's an art. Yep. So I always tell people, like, learn the art of managing up and influencing skills. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so great, because that's going to be in the next section. Yes. Um, <laughs> but also, I would say, um, as an organizational change management consultant, one of the first practices I have any time I go into an organization is I do a stakeholder analysis. And I figure out who are my innovators, 
who are those people who are more willing to take risks or listen to ideas? So you know what I do? I sit in the back of the meetings, and I don't say a word. I just take notes. I watch who talks to who. I sit in the conference rooms. I sit in the break room. I'm everywhere. And I'm just taking notes. And I write my little diagrams. Who bowls with who? Who plays poker on Saturday nights with who? Yeah, that, that when you can get your network down inside your organization, that, my friends, is the map to change. So Seriously. Do you ever find that at the control or the, the board level, um, so change management board where they're going to approve the changes, or okay. at the yeah. management level meeting? Yeah, the executive team, whatever yeah. that is. Uh -huh. Do you find that most of them have um, been with the organization a long time and kind of have done the same things for the same amount of time? And so the people sometimes at the top that are, are going to approve these mm -hmm. new ideas and, and private sector coming in mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. innovation, yeah. they are all kind of like naysayers or they don't want to change or your manager doesn't take things to them because they're like, it is what it is and it's not going to happen. And so... Yep. Okay. So right. I, I get your question. Did everyone hear a question? Basically, what do you do when you have a committee who's making the decisions um, not very open? Uh, that, that's in essence, right? Not very open. They're kind of set in their ways. Um, so honestly, what I would do um, if I were in the org is I would personally meet with each one of them because it's about relationships, people. This is all about relationships at the end of the day. Any training I do that has anything to do with people, it's about relationships. But so sometimes there's a filter between yep. the people that make the decisions yep. and the people with the ideas that yep. would be a benefit. Yep. So if you can't get to them, I would then ask my manager who can get to them. Do you know what Bill wants to leave as a legacy. Do you know? He's got three more years here. What does he want to accomplish? Do you have any idea? And they may go, well, I don't know. I never asked that question before. Well, do you think that might be helpful to know so that we can help him achieve that goal? Because you know what? At the end of the day, it's all about me. It's all about what I, you know, as an executive, right? It's about leaving my legacy. So I would want to find out what do they want to do? What do they want to accomplish? And that might be a way to go about it. I got a hundred others I can tell you after. Okay? All right. Good question. So now we're going to move on to this last section. Uh, you guys hanging in there with us? All right. So we're going to do some more polling uh, to get you active. So this is around cultural and structural barriers, which we all have them. I've been hearing them being mentioned throughout the session. Uh, so let's first start by talking about well, what is organizational culture? Because when I just say culture, we kind of get fuzzy sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, it is kind of fuzzy in a way because it is all of the people in the organization. And it's the set of beliefs and values uh, that kind of form this culture, so to speak. And culture basically drives behavior. It's what's acceptable here and what's not. That's it. That's what your culture is in a nutshell. What can we do and what can't we do? And sometimes when we come in from private sector, which when I first started out as a consultant coming into the state, I came from private sector. Woo, that was a, that was a surprise. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, OK. Um, and so yeah, it's, it's different. It's like, oh, OK, we don't do that here. We do something else. So we want to understand, what is our culture? So you want to think about, what are the things that you hear in meetings? Like Jenny said, oh, no. Or what you said earlier, no, we don't go all the way up there. That's a cultural behavior. That's a cultural norm. We don't access that top layer. That's, a, that's part of your culture, right? So it influences everything we do, all of our decisions. So it's so important that you have a, a pulse of what your 
heard in poor organizational culture is, and then what is your goal? What do you want it to be? Okay, so we defined it. Whoop, sorry. So there are characteristics of any organizational culture, and there's a scale, right? There's a flow. Obviously, one of them is innovation, or what we call uh, risk orientation, which is the technical term in the research books, okay? So that's the first one. We're going to go back to that because that's really the focus of today. But there are some others, right? Precision. It's about accuracy. It's about attention to detail. Are you really high in that attention to detail? Everything's got to be perfect before it goes on. Or are you like, yeah, 80 20? Yeah, there's a couple typos. Let it go. Let me tell you, I've worked in some organizations. Yeah, no, not a typo. Not allowed. Right? You missed a period, pull it back. Seen it. And then there's some that are like, wow. That person didn't even know how to spell we, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, it depends, right? So it's just your orientation. What's acceptable? Then you've got your achievement characteristic, and that's about what are our results? What are we accomplishing? And to what degree is that important inside our culture? The next one is around fairness. This is about the people. How do we treat each other? Do we treat each other with respect and dignity? Or are they a commodity? Are they a number? Right? The degrees. Okay? The next one is how do we interact with, with each other? Is it very individualistic? Or is it all about the team? And which degree are we on there? Are we, you know, if we're on a scale of one to ten, are we a, a five or a seven? Is that what it calls for? Or do we just have a lot of really high, uh, high performers that we count on to get it done and everyone else goes, yay, they got it done again, <laughs> right? Then we got our level of competition. And that can not just be external, it can also be internal. Do we create a lot of competition internally? Do we have teams competing against one another for budget or resources? <laughs> or the funding sources, right? So that creates culture. That's a nice characteristic. And then the last one is stability. And that is really around that rule orientation. How rule oriented are we? Are we just the letter of the law every single time? Or are you know, we kind of the line just a little bit? We'll see how far we can go, okay? So what's our orientation? Okay, so now we've kind of defined the characteristics. And obviously innovation, Right, that we started off with, that's about our level of risk. So, let's now go to, <clears throat> oh, I'm gonna go through one more slide, I forgot. Oops, so then let's talk about one more thing, the individual and how they relate to innovation. So, there is a component, right, because the culture <coughs> is created with a bunch of individuals in it. They come from many different places, which we want that diversity. We need that diversity. But these are all the influences that come to the individual about their level of risk or innovation they're willing to come to the table with. Right? So we've got just our natural uh, national influences. We've got our, you know, what past organizations we've been in, because Guess what? This ain't our first rodeo for most of us. We got a whole bag of, of, you know, just garbage from the past that we drag in with us, right, to the next new job we have. And it's funny because sometimes I'll see people operating and then, oh no, I'm gonna get in trouble. And I'm like, when have you ever gotten in trouble for that here? Really? No, that was like four jobs ago. You know, and people are still crying about it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Okay, so it, it happens. And so that innovation is stifled because of something that happened 15 years ago and not even at that department. <laughs> okay. Or it happened to someone they knew. <laughs> not even to my mom. So I know it can happen. Okay, that happened 10 years ago too. Right? So we bring that. Stakeholders. So what are the influences around, what are, what are they, what is the 
public want? What is the media saying? Right? We have that little thing that we have to deal with. What are our family influences? Now, what is interesting when I bring up the family is that is far more powerful of an influence than all these others. You know why? Because we spend more time with them, right, than anyone else. So a lot of times we'll sit there and when there's a decision to be made or a risk to be taken, what will my dad say about this? Or what would my mom say about this? Okay? And we make a decision. What was their experiences? So there's an influence. We got our peer influences, right? A lot of peer pressure going on inside the organization. So that is also an influence. We've also got policy influence, because ever no one here actually has to do any policy, right? <laughs> no? Okay, good. Uh, no, so there's a lot of policy influences that dictate how much innovation we're willing to even think about. And then finally, we you know we have our cultural and ethnic influences. So cultures complex. <laughs> in a nutshell. That's what, that's what we're saying. So we have to keep all that in mind when then we look at our organizational culture. Okay, so now we're going to... Oh, wait. Let me go back. I think we we're going to do something... Yeah, here we go. So let's do poll. And I'm going to bring that up. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And wrong one. Let me go back. Uh, take it down, sorry about that. Next one. Look at that, Look, check this out. This is really fun stuff, sorry about that. Here we go. And let's bring that up. So I'd like you to think for a second, what are your barriers, your cultural barriers? And you can just literally just type, type it out in a couple of words. What are the top three things that come to mind when you think, oh, that is so a barrier inside my organization around innovation? What is it? Okay? Remember, it's anonymous. We don't see names or numbers. So you can type it up there. Oh, oh, yep. I think you need to mention that. Okay? Budget. So those resources. Mm, ego, management competition. So that characteristic of competition, kind of getting in the way. Resistance, oh, this is always the way it's been done, right? So not, that not, not challenging the, the process, that not challenging that status quo. Yeah. Mm, board members. <laughs> yeah, stakeholders. Ooh, lip service. Ooh, I like that. I don't know, lip service, yeah. Nice. So that's a uh, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Admin versus program. So the competition between the two. I mean, we see that a lot. Now, policy, time, just negativity. Yeah. Oh, I did this before. It's not going to work. I just don't know what to do. Oh, that's good. It's doom and gloom. Yeah, control, old guard versus the new. So you've got kind of that, the competing, I've been here for 20 years, this is the way we've always done it. And then you're like, but we could, but we could. Yeah, we can. <laughs> this is some good stuff. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, rejection or lack of support. So I want you to notice a theme here. What's the theme that you're seeing? Huh? What's the theme? Fear. Fear. It's somebody else. It's somebody else. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, it's out there. That's what we call in the cycle of 
change it to denial. <laughs> <laughs> that D R E C, right? <laughs> Not saying you all in denial. But there's something to be said about our ownership. And what are we willing to do to take that step? Because honestly, when Janine and I, we, we work together quite a bit on Saturday. She's at my house wearing our sweats and we're just having fun. And uh, we talked about two things. We, obviously, we wanted to give you a lot of information today in this session. But two other things. We wanted to leave you inspired to take action. Because we can give you all the information that's in my brain and that the research that we've done, and it will not make a bit of difference unless you do something. So that is why you have an action plan that we have given you. All right? So I want you to start thinking about all the things that we've been talking about because it does start again with the individual. Now I'm going to cover some of the things that we can do in a minute, but I just want you to start thinking about that. All right, so I'm going to flip this back over. Okay. Ooh, okay. i got to jam through this. Okay. All right. So I covered that. So now let's quickly talk about uh, organizational structure. I'm going to do another quick poll, and then I'm going to give you a bunch of information. Okay, so structure. What is organizational structure? The first thing that most people think of when I say organizational structure is that pretty little box, right? And it's not just that. And that's what I want you to start to think. It's not just a hierarchy or who reports to who. It is literally the processes and the systems and how we make decisions that also dictate our structure. It confines or it releases people. The other thing it is, is our leadership. So it, you know, Operational procedures, routines, decision making. That's what I want you to think when I say organizational structure. So let's do a poll again real quick. What are your barriers based on that? Okay. And let me take this down. And get to the next one. Bam. And so what are your barriers, your structural barriers in your organization? Just quickly. What are they? What do you see? Is it your decision-making methods? Is it your communication structure? Hmm. That's interesting, availability of decision makers, right? So things sit because people just who have the power to make the decisions aren't available to make them. Mm, that slows things down, doesn't it? Yeah. Silos, that lack of cross-functional communication and collaboration. Yeah. That was clearance process, yeah. Those with titles for more than people below them. Ouch. <laughs> That's, that's also cultural, right? Because that's a belief. Yeah, so it's both. It's probably your structure and how it's designed and then the beliefs that it has created. Our structure dictates sometimes our culture. So keep that in mind. Sometimes when I go, I'm hired to come in and help an organization achieve different results or better results, the first thing I look not only is their culture but their structure their practices, because a lot of it, I can make a couple of tweaks and it creates a whole different world for them. We don't have to have massive change to have improved results. Okay. All right, so for time, I'm going to flip this back over. Okay, and yet it's not flipping back over. Hello. There we go. All right. So. I'm not, come on. All right. 
technical difficulties, obviously. There we go. So, is your organization ready for innovation? And I'm not going to do this full because it'll take too long. So, if you guys want to know what the questions were, I will give it to you afterwards. Okay? So, here's what I want you to think about. Is your organization, where, are, where do they fall in those cultural areas and influences that we discovered, those characteristics? What risk aversion do you currently have? Where, where's your orientation around rules? Where uh, do you fall with regarding to a leadership and decision making? You want to look at all those. And, and one of the first things I do is I poll or I ask questions of employees. I ask management too, but where I get the really good information is at the employee level. And I ask them questions like, does your work allow for creativity? Does your manager reward accomplishments? Do they celebrate accomplishments? Uh, do you get to think outside the box? And how often? You know, I'm going to ask those questions, and I'm going to put together what I call a profile. Okay? And then if we find out that the organization falls a little shy right, of innovation, then we're going to ask some additional questions. Are these barriers or challenges that we're seeing inside the organization, are they short-term concerns? Are they more long-term systemic <coughs> concerns? Okay. And that's going to dictate our approach, obviously. Are they structural or are they cultural? Are they both? What are the resource requirements if we were to create more innovation inside the organization? No. Would we form a BPI team like we did at EDP? Uh, or what I'm doing in another department right now is uh, we are actually going through a restructuring process and it's not like the executive team is sitting in a room and designing the new organization. Actually, what we're doing is we're taking the data from their time tracking system to find out where people are actually spending the majority of their time and what services they provide. And then we are forming teams of a combination of managers and employees to then look at if we were to improve our services in this area, how would we need to reorganize? And it's fun work because I'm training them on you know, teamwork. We're training them on business presentation skills because they're the ones who are coming up and giving the presentations and recommendations to leadership. The more you can move this down, the more, in, going back to that engagement level, the more engaged people will become. So it looks like I'm coming to time. I got three minutes left. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so here's a couple more questions. Uh, ask your staff what are the critical elements. Top three, because they'll give you a laundry list, right? And then you do some organization and prioritization. What are you going to address? Ask them, how do you think it will benefit your department, section, unit, whatever, to innovate? And then judge the value of the innovation opportunity. Caltrans just recently rolled out this great new awesome internal program uh, on their website. They have, it's called Innovate. And all the employees are allowed to submit ideas for a couple of campaigns at a time. Really cool process that they're rolling out. We were super excited to see it happen a couple months ago. Okay, another thing I would do is do an assessment of your environment, which is more asking questions, okay? And we can't do a complete analysis without doing a SWOT. I know it's not just for strategic planning, right? But you want to ask very specific questions about what is our strengths? Where do we actually excel? What do we do exceptionally well? And then what don't we do exceptionally well? Okay. Um, Let's see. I just got another warning. So we've got <laughs> we blasted that. We've got a couple of process flows because we can't be complete without process flow and an innovation. Uh, but we would want to assess the needs. And what I want to call out here is that we want to connect with our stakeholders. Do not do this in a silo. 
Okay? We want to connect with our stakeholders. We want to find out what their needs are. Because at the end of the day, that's who we're serving. Okay? We're going to do an evaluation. And you'll have access to all these slides because they'll be put on. So we'll do an evaluation for innovation. We'll look at what strategies are we going to you know, go for. Is it ad hoc? Is it vendor related? Is it directive? Is it science related? Or is it just really no strategy whatsoever? And then you can see I did a brain dump, right? Which you will have access to. But basically this says, here are some of the interventions, interventions that we can do culturally. We talked about some of them already. Training, which is coaching, mentoring, okay? Those are key values. Organizational values are so important, they drive behavior. So if you want to innovate, innovation should be part of your value system, okay? Healthy conflict is important to have because you can't innovate unless you're willing to have diverse ideas and work through them, okay? You gotta have trust, which she talked about. Involve stakeholders, which I talked about. We talked about communication and feedback. We need a leadership team that's cohesive because they gotta be able to work through their stuff, okay? And they gotta be aligned, because the more they're aligned, the more the rest of the organization's gonna be aligned. And we need to build healthy relationships. And there are 11 tips on managing up, their best practices, I threw those in there, because we talked about that earlier and how important it is. I also threw in, um, oh, identifying what are the needs of the individual that you're dealing with. Okay, so there are six fundamental human needs, certainty, uncertainty, significance, connection, growth, and contribution. <coughs> and trust me, when you understand what need people have to be fulfilled, it's going to change your script. Okay? All right, structure, interventions, well-governed meetings. It's not that hard, or at least it is. Sorry. <laughs> uh, create an innovation process that can be repeatable, because people are afraid of what does it mean to innovate? Right? Create a process and then repeat it and train people on it. It's really not that hard. Communication. You've got to cascade it. People have to have it and it has to be timely. If it is three weeks old, it is not valuable. Okay? And then decision making. People need to know how decisions are made. Because if not, they're going to think everything is consensus. All right? All right, what questions do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Woo!